They say, great results requires great work. Good people put their work in with Jutane Fit. Personal instructor, Rob Skeet, certified in fitness and nutrition. Tell them Blanco sent you good people. Easy. Good people, good people, what's rocking? You now tuned in, OG Sonny Blocko, I got a story to tell you, heard? And today, a history lesson. And what better time to do it than Black History Month? Listen, if you recall, a couple videos ago, I gave you the story of Jeremiah Hamilton, the first black millionaire in America. Within that story, I referenced one of my favorite documentaries, and that documentary being The Men Who Built America. Yeah, it was a nice little flick, nice little movie. History Channel, they caught that, right? But yo, listen, Blocko, Blocko gonna make his own flick, right? We titling this The Black Men Who Made America. Hey, yo, listen, good people, it's good work over here, right? Tell a friend to tell a friend, share, like, but most importantly, subscribe. Hey, yo, listen, grab your popcorn. Grab your drinks and all of that, right? Get your get right. Whatever your get right is, grab your get right, because it's movie time. Enjoy the presentation. Good people, let me introduce you to the distinguished gentleman, Philip A. Peyton Jr., also known as the father of Harlem. Born February 27th, 1876, in Westfield, Massachusetts. He was the second of four children, the Paytons having one girl and three boys. Mr. Payton was a barber and Mrs. Payton was a beautician. The father insisted that his children all learn the trade. So twice a week after school, he would get the kids together and teach them the family business. Hey yo, nothing for nothing. By the age of 15, Philly Phil was a full-fledged barber. Dr. Joseph Charles Price, the founder of Livingstone College in North Carolina, was a personal friend of Mr. Payton's. Hey yo, listen, sun rolled in high circles, right? That's good company right there. That friendship led to young Philip attending Livingstone College and graduating in 1899. His siblings were also well educated. His sister graduated from Westville State University and both brothers graduated from Yale University. Hold on, we not just go look over that, that right there. We not go look over that. Listen, did you hear what I just said? This is the late 1800s, early 1900s. You know the climate for black people back then, right? This family put all of their kids through college. A girl at that, a young lady at that. You know how difficult that was to get a young lady, let alone a black lady, into a university? We have to take our hat off to the Paytons and commend them people. That was a strong family, right? But back to the story. So Phil, he graduates in 1899, right? He decides right then and there, he wants more for himself, right? He wants bigger and better things. Against his parents' best wishes, good old Phil was off to New York. In New York, he took up odd jobs. He worked in a department store as an attendant for $6 a week. He also had a little side hustle, doing what he knew best, barbering, which also brought in about $6 a week. He was a porter for a real estate office that earned eight dollars a week while working in the real estate office philly phil was getting this hustle on right he was ear hustling and all of that right learning the in, the ins and outs of the game and seeing how it worked from the inside phil created his own firm in october 1900 with a partner by the name of brown but like most first businesses his was a complete failure and good old brown Brown split less than a year later. Listen, 
1901. 1901, it was crazy, it got drastic, right? It was a hell of a year for Phil. It got so bad in 1901. <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah, listen, it's not funny, right? But it got so bad in 1901 for Phil, his dog and his cat died from starvation. <laughs> what type of, hey, yo, yo, they ain't even it, though. They ain't even it. They ain't the worst of it. After that, after the dog and the cat dying, son got put out of his apartment. He got evicted and all of that, right? But yo, listen, you know the saying. Beside every black man is a strong black woman. And Philly Phil, he had him a strong black woman. She held the household down during bad times. She was a seamstress, right? Okay, shortly after he gets evicted from his apartment, things start to look up for Phil, right? He was the, so to speak, middleman on a few deals, which led him to making side deals. Soon after, Philly Phil was stacking his paper. He was getting to that guap, you heard? Making the profits of thousands of dollars a month. Hold on. A few thousand, five, six grand a month? In the 1900s, that's like having 50, 60 grand a month right now, you heard? Yo, listen, hold on. Nothing for nothing, though. Five, six grand a month right now, still good money. Phil was doing his thing, right? But yo, listen. Hayden was quoted as saying, I knew that if I made one good sale, I could make enough to keep me going for a year. I came so near to making a good sale so many times that I knew I was bound to hit it before long. Also, in an interview with the New York Age, Phil is quoted as saying, quote, I was a real estate agent making a specialty in management of colored tenement properties. It was nearly a year before I actually succeeded in getting a colored tenement to manage. My first opportunity came in the result of a dispute between two landlords on West 134th Street. To get even, one of the landlords turned his property over to me and had me fill it with colored tenants. I was successful in renting and managing this house. After a time, I was able to induce other landlords to give me their houses to manage. End of quote. Now, good people, you got to watch it, right? See, the scheme, Phil's scheme was the Great White Flight. The Great White Flight is when the white tenants begin to move out of Harlem for downtown or even other boroughs. This led to the apartments becoming vacant for a period of time. The landlords were losing money hand over fish, you heard? Phil, having a little inside plug, working with the real estate office, he talked a few landlords and they're into black people. Now, good people, you gotta watch this. You see, everybody gotta have a pitch, right? I really don't think Phil felt this way, but this was his pitch to get his foot in the door. The pitch to the white landlords was, you know black people pay more for rent, right? So they took him up on his opportunity, and he ran with it. Building and making connects for his own firm, which allowed him to buy property in Harlem, and buy he did. In 1904, Philly Phil and another business partner, a mortician by the name of James C. Thomas, formed the Afro-American Real Estate Company. He appealed to black investors specifically, issuing 50,000 shares at $10 each. Now hold on, this is why I say I really don't think Phil thought like that. That was just to get his foot in the door, because as soon as he got his foot in the door, he specifically appealed to black investors. Okay, watch this. In 1905, the Hudson Realty Company, a white-owned real estate company, bought a track of land on West 135th Street near Lenox Avenue for residential development. They also bought three of the neighboring buildings from Afro-American Realtor. But listen, the Hudsons, soon as they got them other three buildings, they kicked all the black tenants out and replaced them with white tenants. <laughs> yo, that's crazy. Now, yo, listen, I told you in Jeremiah Hamilton's story, right? 
They say to be a great businessman, you have to possess a supreme ability of shrewdness. Now watch the plate. Watch the plate, good old Philly Phil do, right? Once Phil found out what was going on, the Afro-American Realty Company bought two adjacent apartments and evicted all of the white tenants moving in the same black tenants who just got evicted, right? Eventually, Hudson sold the original three buildings they bought back to Afro-American Realty for a loss, you dig? Shrewdness, hell of a move right there. That's checkmate right there, right? Now listen, this move right here, that boosted Phil's reputation and he drew investors to his company. This, my good people, was the beginning of Black Harlem. Hence, the Harlem Renaissance. Let's give it up to Phil, y'all. Phil did his thing, right? One of the important figures in the black community. One of the black men who built black America. Next on the list, good people, the juggernaut, Casper Holstein, better known as the Bolita King. Born December the 7th, 1876 in St. Croix, then the Danish West Indies, now known as the U.S. Virgin Islands. Birth name, Egbert Joseph. They called him Casper due to his mixed background, but hold on, back up, Egbert? Really, Egbert? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure he liked Casper a lot better. He changed his last name from Joseph to Holstein in honor of his maternal grandfather. His father was a mulatto who owned a butcher shop and a large farm. His mother was the daughter of an officer in the Danish militia. Casper, in 1884, moved to New York with his mother, landing in the world of Brook Lawn. After attending high school in Brooklyn, he enlisted in the United States Navy. After the war, Casper worked as a janitor and a doorman in Manhattan, eventually becoming a messenger and later head messenger for a commodities brokerage on Wall Street. There, he became familiar with the stock market, studying the system and the numbers. He eventually devised a lottery system based on those principles, known as Bolita, or the Clearance House Numbers. The New York Clearance House was a financial institution that facilitated the daily exchanges of many banks in the city. Each day, the New York Clearance House numbers were printed in the afternoon's newspapers. He quickly devised a lottery system based on the Clearance House numbers. It was a gambling game based on the daily closing results. This became known as Bolita, or the Clearance House numbers. By the mid-1920s, Casper was a millionaire two or three times over. He got into real estate and owned properties throughout New York, nightclubs and farmland in Virginia. Holstein was the money man behind the players of the Harlem Renaissance. The entertainers, the musicians, the poets, the artists, you named it, Casper, he helped them. Casper Holstein was known for his philanthropy, a major donor in charities, building dormitories on black colleges, financing many artists, many poets during the Renaissance. He also funded good people Marcus Garvey and bought the mortgage to the New York Hall of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and allowed it to, to continue to be used as a black function hall until Marcus Garvey's organization collapsed. The site was then developed by himself as Holstein's Court, a residential building for black business owners and professionals. But Casper's philanthropy then stopped in Harlem. He went on to build schools in Liberia and established a hurricane relief fund for his native, the Virgin Islands. Yo, listen, the juggernaut, Casper Holstein, was one of the most powerful and influential men if not the most during the Harlem Renaissance. Shout it out, salute, Casper Osteen. <laughs>